Joining me now is fe former federal prosecutor Cynthia Oxney, who's tried more than 50 cases. She's an MSNBC contributor, and Betsy Woodruff, Swan national correspondent at Politico. Uh, Betsy, let me start with you. You reported that Trump is invoking executive privilege over the documents subpoenaed from four of his top aides. Chances are they won't show up for their scheduled depositions next week either. So where does that leave the January 6th committee? Do they have a plan for getting the information they're requesting? Multiple members of the select committee have said that they have been considering the idea of asking the Justice Department to bring criminal charges against any witnesses who defy their subpoenas. For that to happen, of course, the witnesses have to defy the subpoenas, and then the House would vote as a whole as to whether or not to hold those defiant witnesses in contempt. If the House votes to hold those witnesses in contempt, which, by the way, the House did a couple of years ago with Bill Barr, then it would refer to the Justice Department for prosecution the vote that they took. Essentially, a criminal referral would be made. The difference between now and when the House voted to hold Bill Barr in contempt, of course, is that the Justice Department is led by officials who've been appointed by President Biden. So they're not, it's not led by people who are you know, Team Trump. And that means it's much more likely that DOJ would potentially be amenable to getting on board with criminal charges against defiant witnesses. And these charges are no joke. If you're convicted of, of a defying a congressional subpoena, you can be fined up to $100,000, and you can spend up to a year in prison. That's the kind of thing that really makes people worried, Anna. It's no small threat. So that's the threat. Cynthia, you're a former federal prosecutor. A lot of people on social media today, I noticed, were referring to Donald Trump's actions in terms of telling these four people don't cooperate as the, amounting to obstruction of justice. Is that a view you share? Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, because that's, to me, that's obviously what it is. I mean, these are essentially co-conspirators and he's, and he, and he's doing what he always does to uh, make the system impossible for the system to work. The problem is that no one's going to charge him with obstruction of justice. I mean, we aren't framed that way. In fact, I'm really worried that the, the Department of Justice hasn't taken over this whole investigation to get his hands around it. I mean, it doesn't do any good on some level to prosecute people for criminal contempt if ultimately you never get their testimony. I mean, that's what we need, right? We don't, we don't need Bannon to have to pay money. We need, or Bannon to get probate, and I don't think he'd end up with a year, I think he'd end up with probation, but uh, what we need is the information. And I don't think there's any way to get that through this congressional testimony system. I mean, after all, we're 10 months in and subpoenas are going out now and there isn't really uh, a quick path, in my opinion, to get them, um, to get them yeah, enforced. Good point. The, the Senate, the, Dick Durbin said today they couldn't even send a subpoena to Jeffrey Clark because they don't have the vote in the rule. The, their rules are against issuing a subpoena unless there's somebody Republican on the committee who will agree to it. Well, you can't have an investigation of what happened on January 6th and the cover up with Trump if you can't even subpoena Jeffrey Clark. I mean, it just needs yeah. to be a big theory investigation at the Justice Department and we need to move it there. So. Yes, we do. Uh, Betsy, you also have new reporting that gives a fuller picture of the, some of the intelligence, the chatter swirling around as early as late December um, about a possible attack. Of course, we heard the former Capitol Police chief tell Congress there was no intelligence that a violent mob would storm the Capitol. Give us a sense of what was flying around, where the gaps were. There literally was an intelligence product produced by a firm that, that sends out intelligence to subscribers, whose subscribers include major law enforcement entities in the FBI. There literally was a piece of intelligence they sent out saying that Trump supporters online were saying an insurrection was the plan. This product that I viewed, thanks to excellent open records work by the nonprofit Property of the People, literally used the word insurrection, and it was sent to federal law enforcement in late December. They had plenty of time. There was another product that site intelligence sent out, cites the firm that contracts and does this work for the federal government. There was another product they sent out saying that a user on a neo-Nazi telegram channel explicitly said that Trump supporters on January 6th, if Congress did not vote to try to make Trump president and override the Electoral College, should march into the Capitol to frighten lawmakers. That's exactly what happened. 
these threats, yes. these plans were being made in plain sight. Not only were they made in plain sight, but people who were aware of those plans flagged them, highlighted them to law enforcement, and still law enforcement didn't do anything. The argument that U.S. Capitol Police make is that January 6th happened because of an intelligence failure. I don't think that's an argument we can take seriously anymore. There was so much intelligence. Yes. And the three words you use, in plain sight, are quite important. Uh, Cynthia, there are also new subpoenas today for two people involved in a Stop the Steal rally that also took place on January the 6th. Um, separate from the rally Trump spoke at, they include a key Stop the Steal leader, Ali Alexander, and a man named Nathan Martin. Now, they're not government officials or in, directly in Trump's orbit, so they're not covered under executive privilege, under any definition of that. Whatever Trump definition he puts forward to protect Mark Meadows, his former chief of staff, these two aren't, and even Steve Bannon, he hasn't been employed by Donald Trump for several years. He's a podcaster. So how much is that argument going to hold up? Well, I don't think it's going to hold. Uh, Ali Alexander is pretty interesting because he's on tape saying things that he actually had conversations with Gosar and Biggs, who you played earlier yes. in the lead up, and Mo Brooks. He's an interesting guy. But, you know, he's got a Fifth Amendment right. So, uh, and that's not going anywhere. Uh, and... Uh, it, what, what this highlights is they're moving so slowly and they don't really have a choice. They're not really structurally built to do a quick grand jury investigation. Someone has to build a grand jury investigation that begins with Ukraine and and trying to steal the election by pressuring Ukraine, going through every all those statements that it was going to be stolen, the pressuring of the DOJ, the pressuring of Georgia, the firing of PAC, the pressuring of Pence, the Eastman plan, and the January 6th rally. It all fits together, but you can't do it without, <laughs> excuse me, going to DOJ. <coughs> um, <laughs> take a breath there. It's after your wise words, you can take a cough. Uh, quick, uh, Betsy, quick last question. We're out of time, but you, you're reporting on this stuff. The Democrats you're talking to, we hear from Benny Thompson, the chair of the committee. Dick Durbin, we played him earlier. Do Democrats really get what's at stake here? Are they moving with the speed that Cynthia suggested they need to move at? There was a weird moment a couple months ago when a separate congressional committee, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, was getting significant momentum in their investigation into what was going on at the Justice Department in Trump's final days. And then once this different January 6th select committee was set up, that first investigation got essentially shut down and there was a weird gap for several weeks when there wasn't any investigative activity going on that was precious time that got lost because of restructuring by the way that the democrats were handling this probe and that's something that i hear concerns about that the january 6th select committee hasn't moved as quickly as it could and that it had sort of this slow okay. runaway time and the result is that they have less time to work with than they might have we will have to leave it there. We're out of time. Cynthia Oxley and Betsy Woodrow-Swan, appreciate both of your analysis tonight. and for, Thank you for coming on the show. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.